Can two walk together? Privacy enhancing methods and preventing tracking of users. Web cookies. So web cookies were introduced in 1994 with a perfectly legitimate reason for enabling session management. The classical example was shopping carts. You want to allow people to shop, put things in their shopping, their uh, virtual shopping carts. Of course, we know what happened since then. They became a major surveillance devices and users are being tracked in uh, very across websites by various companies. So we see that something pretty benign can actually become a handle for tracking. This is exactly what we want to study and suggest methods for preventing. So a motivating example would be a collecting homepage statistics. So suppose that you have a browser developer who wishes to learn about the homepages of users. Because for instance, they want to know if suddenly a, a homepage became very popular or which can be an indication of a virus or for various other reasons. So the reports are collected twice a day, let's say. And because the browser developer is aware of uh, differential privacy and privacy issues, the noise is added to each report. Now, furthermore, because we are going to have repeated, uh, repeated collection of data, the noise is correlated. Perhaps it's exactly the same noise each time. So the users uh, correlate the noise because otherwise, if the noise is independently, then a, a, an adversary who, who tunes in can, can average out the noise and figure out what it actually is being is sent out. So now, how can this be used for tracking? Well, exactly the, the reports or some approximation of the reports become the, the handle on that user. So suppose we have a user, Alice, she reports in the morning from the office <clears throat> and from night she reports from home. And we have an adversary who tries uh, to identify the IP address of where Alice lives. So what does the adversary do? Considers two reports, a report from the morning and a report from night, and sees whether the, the reports sent uh, in the morning and the, and the reports sent at night whether they are of the same nature, whether let's say they're identical or similarly distributed. And uh, if the adversary does that, and if it can distinguish between the case that it's one user or two different users, then it can distinguish, uh, then it can figure out whether a given IP address is indeed or uh, Alice's homepage IP address. And this is exactly what we're trying to prevent. So what will we talk about? Well, we'll our motivation is Google's report, which is roughly system for what I just uh, described. And then we will talk about the new definitions of everlasting privacy and of untracking, and, and, and discuss what composition theorems we have for tracking, and the connection between everlasting privacy tracking and what we call change point detection where you, you detect that the user has actually changed uh, their value, their input. We'll briefly talk about the analysis of Google's reporting or framework and a mechanism for reporting single bits with everlasting privacy and a general method for converting local differential privacy into mechanisms with everlasting privacy and almost perfect preventions of tracking. So far, the good news, the not so good news is that the Prevention of tracking is true only for a limited number of sessions. And we'll finish with uh, open problems. Um, so Google's rapport was really an early wide-scale deployment of differential privacy. It was one of the early examples of wide-scale deployment. And the goal there was indeed to learn all sorts of uh, telemetrics from, uh, from, uh, from your browser. For instance, the home page, that's one of them. And the idea was to encode the way it works is you, you took the, the you take the home page and you encode it in a bloom filter manner in a in an array. So initially the array is very sparse, has only a few ones and almost all zeros. And but then it's randomized and each bit is flipped with a certain probability. And that's called the permanent randomization. 
this permanent randomization stays the same for, for a while. Each time a user reports, a, 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 what it does, a, the user randomized, sends a randomized report of the permanent randomization, so further noise is added. So in, in R1, you take a copy of the permanent randomization, add some more noise to it, and send the result. Same, similarly in R2, etc. And then a, a server who receives these reports can figure out statistics about the popular home pages if the noise is not uh, too too large. So uh, the problem, uh, if we try to actually prevent exactly what I described, what I said before, whether input belong, whether two sets of input would belong to one user or two, then the problem is that the permanent randomization is unique to each user. So that's exactly the issue that they try to combat. So the permanent randomization is going to be unique for each user. But then you're generating something that is not far enough from the permanent randomization. So if you see a whole bunch of reports from one user or two, re or, uh, two bunches, one from one user and one from the other, even if they started with the same initial value, with the same email.com, you're going to get two different uh, distributions and you'll be able to, to figure that out. And this is exactly <coughs> what we're trying to prevent. So, uh, and this is, was actually uh, also what was on the mind of the rapport authors, uh, Erlingson et al, who wrote uh, in their paper, uh, this modification, this modification uh, uh, significantly increases the difficulty of tracking a client based on B, B is the permanent transition, which could otherwise be viewed as a unique identifier in the longitudinal reporting scenario. This is what they have in mind, and that's why they had the on-the-fly uh, randomization. So now we're trying to define what we mean by the antrocability. Uh, so we have a report, we think of the scheme as the report uh, stream generator. We have a mechanism M that is a randomized algorithm receiving an input user input U and generator reports in R. They, we're going to apply it n times, so executed n times, and each time uh, it's going to output something. Now the mechanism could be stateless, so each execution is run in, uh, without regards to the history. It could be stateful with a state maintaining a state that is being updated as well as everything else. And it could be permanent state mecha mechanism, which is what uh, the rapport me uh, mechanism has. That is, we generate one uh, permanent state, and each further execution is independent of uh, any other execution. It just starts with the permanent states and does something with it, but it, the permanent state never changes. So these are uh, three possibilities. Now, what do, uh, uh, we want to recall the definition of differential privacy. In differential privacy, we are reporting information about a database of a users' inputs. And we want to, if two uh, neighboring databases differ in, in one user value, then uh, on all possible outputs, we want the two distributions to be very close to each other in uh, this form. We, we know that uh, differential privacy has very nice uh, properties in unit to side information and very strong composition theorems. The parameters deteriorate roughly with square root the number of applications. In particular, we'll be interested in local differential privacy where each user reports on its own, uh, based on its own input without regards to the other users, uh, a value to, to a center, which is the, the scenario that we have in mind. So this is differential privacy. Everlasting privacy, we say that a mechanism and uh, that reports in, in the range R is uh, epsilon delta dif uh, everlasting differential privacy. If executing it n times for any number of uh, uh, rounds n, still results in uh, differential privacy. In uh, differential privacy, the total result is still differential privacy. So no matter how many times you execute it you're still going to, to get something which is uh, differentially private. This is what we call everlasting privacy. Okay, and now what is untrackable? Where, when do we say that a mechanism is uh, untrackable, prevents tracking? So our definition is uh, definitely inspired by differential privacy. 
the reports generated by two users are similar to reports generated by a single user. So if you have these two scenarios, either the reports come from blue and green users that have the same information, or they come from one user, everyone is green, these two cases should be uh, indistinguishable. So you shouldn't be able to tell whether you're on the left or whether you're on the right. Uh, so more formally, so we have this set of reports. I, they either come from a single user or they came from two different users with the same value. And we say that the mechanism is gamma delta untrackable if for all user u and all subsets of indices, all possible partitions, uh, you cannot tell whether uh, they, they came from one user or whether they came from two different users in, the, in a sense similar to, to the definition of uh, differential privacy. So you have a bunch of outputs and uh, you, either they came from a single user, that's one case, so it's not going to be much different in, in, if they came from two different users who of course operate independently. And we want to similar, similarly we want the other uh, derivation. So this is how we define untrackable. We say that the mechanism is untrackable if it has this property. Now, of course, you could ask, is this the right definition? Is this the only one? Why two? Why not many? Uh, so, well, you never know if you have the right definition, if it's the ultimate definition, but of course, we, we, we can see how robust it is. So for instance, you, we could have defined many user, the many user version, and we can show that you can go from the two user version at the parameter loss and get the many user version. So at least we're in the right ballpark. Uh, then of course, we'll also see um, composition theorems, which are indication that we are on the right track. So in multiple uh, user uh, untrackability, of course, instead of two, uh, we're comparing the case where we have one user versus the case where we have multiple users. And of course, you could be even more greedy and you can say any two partitions here, you cannot tell uh, where they came from. And uh, you can show that, you, that two, the case of two implies the multi-user case with some loss of uh, parameters. What about composition? Well, if we are going to, if we have a untrackable, if we have an M-fold composition of an untrackable mechanism, we get something that is, if we have gamma delta parameters untrackable here, we get gamma prime delta prime untrackable here, where delta prime is whatever we want it to be, where uh, gamma prime uh, gamma prime deteriorates roughly with the square root of uh, something like square root of uh, M, the number of applications. In this square root is now a coincidence. It is based that uh, the proof of the theorem is based on the advanced composition of uh, differential privacy. Okay, so uh, what can we do? Well, let's talk about a general scheme for obtaining untrackable mechanisms from local differential privacy. You can actually take any, if you have a mechanism which is LDP, local differentially private, you can turn it into an untrackable mechanism for a limited number of executions. What do you do? You memorize a fixed number L of executions of a local privacy preserving computation. So you do it L times. At each data collection, the mechanism mimics one of these executions at random. It picks one of those L uh, executions and uses it. Everlasting privacy is maintained by the finite access you have to a user's data. Only in the worst case, even if you run it many, many times, you have only L different accesses to, to locally differentially private computation. Uh, on the other end, uh, and using advanced composition, you can derive uh, everlasting differential privacy. Now, uh, you can argue from birthday, for instance, bounds, that as long as you have fewer than square root of L rounds, you are not never, if the adversary witnesses just fewer than square root of L rounds, it's not very likely to see the same execution twice. So uh, tracking is going to be difficult, right? Because all these C's are uh, the diff independent, differentially private execution. But of course, once you go over square root of L, you is very likely to see two such things and then all bits are off. 
Okay. What about, I promise you also, undetectable changes? So like the untracking definition uh, uh, here, we, what we want to hide is the fact that the user changed their data. Okay, so here, the user changed from google.com to msn.com. They changed their, uh, went from google.com to msn.com and we're trying to, to hide that fact. So we want to say that these two cases, the left one and the right one, are indistinguishable or hardly distinguishable from, from the server's point of view. We cannot tell whether a user changed their mind or not. Okay, and the, the formulation is again similar to the way we do it in differential privacy. We're saying, um, and the way we did it in untracking, we say that it's gamma, delta, und undetectable for all user data U and U prime and all subset of indices J and all subset of reports string J and S, it's hard given uh, uh, the probability that the output uh, uh, is going to be in S is going to be related to what, what uh, to the, is, is going to be not much, uh, uh, is not, it's going to be smaller than e to the uh, gamma times the probability that it's in SJ, the projection on J, on the J indices that, it, that are U, and the projection on the other indices that are U prime. So these two probabilities, so uh, these, this is the upper bound, and similarly we have a lower bound, just as in the, in the uh, uh, as we had in the untracking uh, definition. Okay, so this is the definition of undetectable. You cannot decide whether user changed their data or not. And now, uh, what we have is that we can connect all those notions. If we have a mechanism that is gamma uh, delta untrackable and has epsilon delta prime everlasting privacy, then it's going to be gamma plus epsilon delta max undetectable for delta, which is very close to, to delta and delta prime, something like delta plus uh, delta prime. So once you have untrackability and you have everlasting privacy, you achieve for free the undetectability. Okay, so what's left to do? Well, one is that we don't have really, a, a, do we have a, la a lower bound on the trade-off between everlasting uh, differential privacy uh, and the untrackable parameters? So we want a trade-off between accuracy, everlasting differential privacy and untracking parameters. Particularly, the single bit that we ended up not talking about is it the best one uh, one can hope for, or are there better uh, mechanisms for the single bit? Now, as we mentioned, the downside of the general scheme that we've seen is the rapid deterioration in the untrackable parameter once the number of repetitions, once the number of sessions reaches square root of L, then all bits are off. Is there a scheme with a more graceful degradation in the untrackable parameter? Now, finally, all the schemes considered are permanent state mechanisms. And one may ask whether changing the state between executions can help achieve better untrackable parameter bounds. Thank you.